This program is made possible in part by New Mexico Arts, a division of the Department of Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. Funding for Colores was provided in part by Frederick Hammersley Foundation. This time on Colores, muralist Aaron Noble and young artists at Albuquerque's Warehouse 508 paint a portal to another universe. I want people to know anything is possible as long as you have a belief in your uh, ability of whatever you want to do and the impossible can become possible. Drawing New York City's buildings, illustrator James Gulliver Hancock found his sense of place. So this project just started out as a diary for me. It's like my way of writing what's happening to me. The Third Coast Kings mix funk, jazz, and Motown to create their own take on an old sound. I think musically, Detroit's got an incredibly deep musical history. So, I mean, for me, it's something that's very special to be a part of it in some way. Mark Bradford, AKA Scrab Daddy, turns other people's junk into magical mechanical beasts. You have to work with what you got, that's my motto. It's all ahead on Colores. With a tremendous new Quantum Bridge mural, young artists make the impossible possible. I came out for a, for a week before we did the project and looked at the wall and tried to figure out what wanted to be living on that wall. If it's a portal into some universe, what universe is this a portal into? The quantum bridge. The quantum bridge. Quantum, quantum bridge. The, the bridge. bridge. Space-time continuum bridge. <laughs> uh, it's because it's blending the idea of bridge between time. The quantum bridge. So, it's perfect. The quantum bridge. <laughs> quantum bridge. <laughs> Bigger? Bigger. <laughs> the quantum, quantum bridge. bridge. Hallelujah. So this is the quantum bridge mural. <laughs> what the idea of the quantum bridge is you're connecting universes and you're connecting three different uh, lifespans too. lifespans you're connecting the past present and future and a lot of young folk only really see what's right ahead of them relatively if we connect the past present and future you're looking at where you came from to represent what you're doing now and then what you could potentially do in the future it fits perfectly with what we're trying to do you know the mural makes you reflect on what the possibility can be and how are you gonna break from this stereotype of just graduating and then going to McDonald's, you know? Well, to me, art is the language of hope. To me, it represents a lot of what we're trying to do here at 508 to encourage all that energy and all the creative that we have as young artists and bring something different to our city and something new for people to be inspired by. The reason I'm, I'm attracted to murals is a lot of things, but the scale is really important. Uh, when, I was, when I was a kid, when I was 19, I went to Mexico City and I saw the, um, the great uh, Diego Rivera murals. There was something in the, the energy and the scale of uh, the power of those. That reminded me of the other artwork that I loved, which was Jack Kirby comics, superhero comics. These huge bodies and this super force. Uh, so I just always wanted to kind of try to get at that somehow. Another thing about murals is that they're public and I just find that more inspiring. I am not too good with heights. <laughs> heights has never been my thing, and I had to overcome that fear. It's 140 feet long. It's 24 feet high at the highest point. I think the square footage of this is uh, about 1,700 square feet. There are some times I would go up to the third or fourth story of scaffolding, and. I would be shaking, but I had to suck it up and just deal with it.
It was our jungle gym. <laughs> My favorite part is the actual handwork. We use paintbrushes. This is all brushwork. Oh man, this, this mural almost destroyed me. It was so hot when we started that the paint was steaming as we applied it to the wall. And it was so cold when we finished that we had to heat the wall with a big space heater so that the paint could dry properly and not freeze. We were painting in the snow. Uh, we were painting in the middle of the night in sub-zero temperatures. It was an incredible battle to get this mural up on this wall. It was very intimidating coming up to a wall like this and having to do grid it out and transfer the images onto the wall and having every line land in just the right spot. And that was painstaking and it was difficult. And I worked them really hard. I know it was tough for them, but they never showed it. They kept their spirits were great. They were optimistic. They were energetic. Uh, I think they probably learned a lot about what it takes to do a wall of this scale uh, and probably stretch their own, their own uh, capacity. Uh, he's like a ninja. Yeah. He's like a, like a samurai. Good Very bird. practiced, yeah. um, smooth, calm, uh, taking strokes with you know, confidence too. The way of the muralist. Even seeing him do it was a little unreal. Especially the kind of wall that's kind of stuck. It was, it was, it was texture yeah. yeah. Yeah, a very textured wall, so. The wall is so big. You know, if you, don't, if you don't get up every morning and get out there and keep going even way past the point of exhaustion, it just won't get finished. Yeah, it's the discipline of the wall. But in the end, it's all worth it. In a way, it felt like a responsibility or a greater duty. It was painting our home, and uh, I felt honored. It means the world to me. I want people to know anything is possible as long as you have a belief in your uh, ability of whatever you want to do. and. The impossible can become possible. And uh, I really would like for, for adults to really uh, um, see that it was done by youth of the city and showing how their dedication to the city and how this is now one of the biggest walls in Albuquerque is, uh, is a statement. Don't hesitate. Don't be afraid to get yourself out there. The accomplishment is like nothing you could ever imagine. Quantum is a, is a, a sudden step up in, in, a, in something, a, an exponential jump, a leap upwards uh, to a higher level, uh, dramatically so. And um, I think that the, periodically throughout a person's life, this can, you can have these moments, these quantum moments where suddenly your, your horizon opens up and you, you have new strength and new, new possibilities for yourself. And uh, as an old superhero fan, I, that's what I'm about. I'm about that metaphor of superpower. And I think superpowers are really real. So the Quantum Bridge is definitely a, sort of a youth-oriented mural, maybe even more than all my stuff is youth-oriented. And I wanted to, to get that, that idea that you can make huge leaps in your life. You work hard, you have discipline, you train, you train, and then one day, boom, you're at the next level. And so this mural presents a past level, a present level, and a future level, and then it shoots off into space. Australian illustrator James Gulliver Hancock captures New York City's buildings and has never looked back. I don't really have a favorite building. They're all my favorite when I'm drawing them, you know? It's, it's the one that I'm in front of that I'm in love with at the particular time. You know, it's easy to say the classic buildings or, you know, the brownstones and stuff like that, but 
Yeah, it's really, that's what's the beauty of New York, that everything seems different all the time. When you stop and pay attention to a different thing, something else is different and interesting. It's changing all the time. So I'm uh, attempting to draw all the buildings in New York. I'm not from New York, I'm an Australian, and I came here a few years ago. And I've always used drawing as a way to understand what's around me. And New York was pretty overwhelming when I arrived, so I thought I'd do that here. And uh, drawing buildings helps me make a map of the place for myself and understand it better. So drawing buildings was really obvious to me. It was such a symbol of the place, you know, growing up watching TV, seeing brownstones on Sesame Street and other things in uh, film. The first building I drew was down in Carroll Gardens where we first moved and it was a quick black and white sketch of probably of the building we were living in. It was a classic sort of four-story building with a little shop down the bottom and apartments up the top. So this project just started out as a diary for me. It's like my way of writing what's happening to me. I don't use words, so I, I use pictures instead. So it's just a, it just started as a journal. I just wanted to um, record what I was seeing and, and have a memory of it more than a photograph. And it was really useful in that respect because it made me stop and look a bit more than I would otherwise. So you see all these little details around you and pay attention to things that you otherwise wouldn't. It's fascinating here how there's all different types of buildings on one street. So there'll be you know, two townhouses, then a weird old church, and then a really contemporary construction. And that juxtaposition usually is what pulled something out for me. I've probably drawn so far over a thousand. I'm not sure exactly how many. I'm not very good at keeping count. I just keep drawing and uh, save them somewhere. I have no idea how long it's going to take to draw all the buildings, but if you did the math, I guess, so someone said there's like 900,000 in, I think it's just Manhattan or something like that. So if I'm doing one a day, it's 365 buildings a year times however many. I don't know, it's like 3,000 years or something, so we'll see. Detroit's the Third Coast Kings create its own take on an old sound. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the Third Coast Kings. We love the fact that you are here right now. Get ready to get down, because it's been a long week. And now, we are all here together. Don't get it wrong, don't get it twisted. Friday night, let's get lifted. I had a few different bands that I had been working on and um, I guess I sort of realized that there was a certain type of music that I was I was getting closer to and it's something that was more meaningful to me and that was funk music it was it was more like a subgenre of the deep funk the deep soul stuff like that and uh, I started looking around on the internet and I, I ended up finding a bass player and uh, my guitar player was Steve, who's actually now the bass player. So we put the band together and it was a few different things, um, a few different names. We were the Monarchs, we were Styles Davis. So we eventually settled down on, on the Third Coast Kings, which was where we got serious. And uh, we decided that this was gonna be the thing that you know, we, would, we would launch to, to the public. Well, I love the feeling of it. I guess, I mean, you could call that the soul of it or the groove or something like that, but I just, I think um, it makes you feel good. It makes you want to move. What this band is as if James Brown during the years 1968 and 1975 had maybe a little bit more jazzy horn sections. The charts are almost a little more slice of bebop and big band jazz. Um, with a drummer that's playing at a little different tempo than the James Brown songs. My direction was um, some of the old school funk stuff, some of the obscure stuff. It's something that's it's got a lot more power to it, it's got a lot of uh, feeling to it, and it's harder to find. So there were a lot of DJs that were digging up these records, you know, looking for this deep funk sound. and. Uh, you know, once I locked into that and started following what they were doing, that's where I discovered our sound. Girl, wanna get to, yeah. See, a 
tidal wave of Monet's when you caress my face and my camera love your skin tone. Do I even love your cell phone? Call me. I will simulate the making of waves. Cause you're so special. I mean, it came from soul music. It came from Motown. And at the same time, there were so many other bands, the, you know, in the big sea of things, there are all these little fish that are trying to compete for the same sound. And uh, the stuff that we try to recreate are those little fish. It's, you know, track eight, side two of an album they own, but they didn't hear it more than the first time. So it's like, oh, wow. And so I, I guess a lot of our songs that we write that are ours, uh, we try to have that, oh, wow. Factor. I'm winning so much in this forward in life. I'm the best. You just ain't never seen. Take a deep breath. Don't be so mean. We're, we're a funk band and we do funk music, you know. We don't dally and a whole lot of other stuff. It's deep funk, you know. And people get it, you know, when they when they hear us. And honestly, as complicated as my life is sometimes, it's, it's, it's nice to be like, this is what it is. It's one thing that we do. You can focus on that. It's all got to have a foundation. It's like a house for us. It's, um, it always starts with me and my bass player. We come up with some grooves. From there, once we have something that we like, we'll record it and then send it off to the horn players and they write on top of that. I just play the rhythm that I know is, uh, is the right sound, it's the right fit. And then uh, I leave the guys to the rest. You know, we interact, you know, it's all, it's a nice creative process. You know, we'll spend time in the think tank and um, it always works out. You don't see a lot of bands with that many people in them. We've got, you know, guitar, bass, drums, trumpet, trombone, saxophone, two singers, so eight people. I think it's a it's a simple sound. It's very, you have um, the horns, which have a very specific kind of sound, and then the driving rhythm section. Um, and I think we try to, we really try to make our music as simple as possible and kind of strip down to the style. I think that's where the deep funk comes in, is that it's, it's really supposed to be just about that, that groove at the center of it all. Now imagine. You are in a 1982 Cutlass Supreme. And you are driving down Woodward in Detroit, Michigan. Influenced by Detroit Lot, our, our, our upcoming album. Um, you know, we've got some song titles on there about Detroit, West Grand Boulevard, Mayors of Detroit. I mean, the, the heritage in Detroit, the music is is huge. You know, so it's very inspiring. You know, in that regard, and there's a lot, there's a lot of good funk. What this song is all about? I think musically, Detroit's got an incredibly deep musical history. So, I mean, for me, it's something that's very special to be a part of it in some way and s somehow try to continue that history that's there. Um, I think we have a huge responsibility to try to represent Detroit in the best way we can. In fact, to me, if we say we lived anywhere in Michigan, called ourselves a funk band, and didn't try to play in Detroit, then that's a penalty, that's a personal foul. If you're near Mecca, you go to Mecca. You can go anywhere on this planet and say, we're from Detroit. And people will have to lay down a little bit of respect, whether they've heard you or not. But Detroit has that grit that makes the funk great. Hey, if you wanna get some, you gotta leave some. If you wanna get some, you gotta leave some. Music lives on. For us, this kind of music was deeply important. I just want other people to feel that, really. And so if we can play it and some other person will hear it, maybe they don't even know it's funk, but maybe they'll go look up a musician, go, go try to find um, some other music that's like this and keep the, keep the tradition alive. We love you. Good night. 
Mark Bradford, a.k.a. Scrap Daddy, has turned his childhood interest into a larger-than-life metal art wonderland. My name is Mark Bradford. I also go by the name Scrap Daddy because uh, I like to go around to Houston scrapyards and collect things. My great-grandfather was an inventor in Louisiana, and growing up, I saw this big steel plant. I mean, it's like they forged these big, giant Hendrix dragline buckets inside of this big warehouse that I never got to go in. And I was like, oh my god, what, how do they do that? I uh, was a bicycle courier in downtown Houston, and there's that big triangular Moreau sculpture. And I was like, I don't want to be a bicycle courier all my life. I took four years of welding, and I took all different kind of TIG, MIG, all kind of heliarc, all kind of weird, crazy things to learn how to put metal together. And then, you know, that's the first step. And then it was a lot of, ever since, it's been trial by error. Nicole's like, why do you keep working on this thing? I, I worked on this thing for a long time. I work with what I got. And like, I've had some critics say, Mark, that's ugly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, but I had Bob Wire, you know, what am I going to do with it? I mean, it's, it's ugly because it's, that's what I had to work with. You like it? <laughs> it's impressive. Come on, baby. Yay. Hi. It's kind of at an angle, isn't it? Normally, you know, you like to build a model first, like this one. But I built Mr. Green, which, you know, I'll never do again. I always build something small to figure out how it works. I'm constantly wanting to learn more. You know, I just can't do the same thing twice because when you spend so many hours building something, you want to, you know, be excited about seeing if it works or not. And then that's why I come up with uh, crazy contraptions. This is my art car. A lot of art car artists in Houston have vehicles that they uh, drive. I asked myself what would have happened if I grew up in another city where there wasn't the art car parade, or, I, I don't know. I mean, and the art around town in Houston, the, the big sculptures that are around, when I grew up, I saw, you know, those pieces, and it, you know, just always appealed to me. This is Ely, and I uh, had made the Spoonazoid the year before, and it's completely covered in spoons. These are spoons from American Airlines out of Dallas. And after 9-11, they got rid of all their metal utensils. I didn't have any enough left to do this car, so but I had all the handles and I made fans. It's good to run out of something because uh, it makes you come up with something else. But it feels good to be back up here. And you know, I have dreams, you know, of getting everything uh, looking and running great to do a performance with all the vehicles. You know, that's like, I would never throw it away or anything, you know. This is Azabah, and this is um, one of my earlier art cars that I built in 1999. And uh, it, it's like the animal, he's grabbing a hold of the motors, and he's like, why walk when you can roll? I built all the skeleton, and then I put two motors that run together. So like, I lay head first in a hammock in there. I look out of this medallion, and then someone rides on the saddle up here. Everybody thinks that uh, she's driving it, but actually I'm in there head first looking out of the window. And this was my first hydraulic machine. It's like half spoon car and half motor or whatever. But I stand up here and it's like the Bronco Bull from Gillies totally inspired me. And then I like up here surfing it and uh, it wasn't able to hold up its own weight on the eight legs. So I had to put three wheels under there, but it still looks really cool. And uh, 
this is the vehicle that I learned all the, the stuff I did with the hydraulics. You know, I want my work to survive time and uh, people to enjoy it. I mean, that's, that's the main thing is like to make something and see people smile and, and like it. You have to work with what you got. That's my motto. You don't have to buy new things. You can reuse stuff and, and just make it happen with nothing. <laughs> Oh my God, thank God, huh? Next time on Colores. Santa Fe Santera Marie Romero Cash shares how she needed to push the boundaries of creativity. Once I started going beyond the rules, it just became a, a matter of one-upmanship. And I wasn't competing with everybody else in market, I was competing with myself. Turning trash into treasures, artist Richard Burkett has been making fantasy clocks for almost 30 years. I enjoy taking things apart. I like finding some little gadget that doesn't work anymore and then finding out what's inside. Sometimes there's nothing in there. Ceramic artist Sarah Swink creates characters from dreams and nightmares. Judgment stops the process cold. So that is a practice. That's a real everyday practice to suspend judgment, let the, the ideas just flow and go with where the energy is. Playwright Terrell McRaney's adaptation of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra takes place during the Haitian Revolution. What I wanted to do is make sure that if I was going to do a play like Antony and Cleopatra, that that history still spoke to the people in my community. Until next time, thank you for watching. Funding for Colores was provided in part by Frederick Hammersley Foundation.